And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I am live today, and I hope I make it. Hope I make it through the whole two-hour broadcast today. Um, I'm working from a new computer, running a new operating system. I'm using Windows 10 now. It's brand new, and I'm, so far, I did some tests, and everything seems to be working okay. And I'm, I'm working with uh, new software. This is Wirecast 6. Um, what I have been uh, streaming with is, uh, for the last, well, ever since I started doing Pastor Mike Online, was Wirecast version 4, and they have, they have greatly enhanced uh, Wirecast ability over the last few years. But I'm telling you, it's pricey. It is, it's got a little expense related to it. We've been using Wirecast 6 for our church streaming and uh, seems to work out okay. It's, but this is a little bit different interface than what I'm used to seeing here every day. You get used to everything being right where it's supposed to be. So I fell into a near panic when I'm ready to push all the buttons and come on and I'm going, okay, where's the shot that I need? Um, if you could get like a look at what I'm looking at. Hang on a second, let me do this. I hate to do this, mess up my screen, but anyway. That's roughly what I am looking at. All these different layers here um, are stacked one on top of another. You got to know which one to press and which one to go with, and how to stack them and everything like that. So it may, I, I'm still working out the interface issue, but I'm hoping <clears throat> that we are. I'm pretty sure we're streaming. I'm pretty sure that I am recording, so we can get this online. I want you to open your Bibles. To Psalm 139. I, I come in every day, uh, especially on uh, Pastor Mike Online Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes I don't have a clue what I'm going to be talking about, and um, God just kind of opens things up, and, and boy, there it is. And I got an email from a guy this morning, and um, I, I, I'm going to, I want to read his name because I want to give him credit. Um, I don't see anything in here where he says, I'll come to you and strangle you if you tell my name. I can tell you he's from India. He goes by the name of Smithy. That doesn't sound like an Indian name. It smells like an Indiana name, not an Indian name. But anyway, he sent me this. It's on blood, and I'm going to be sharing it with you. I've, I've let the cat out of the bag that I am going to redo uh, the entire body series. Uh, we did this at our homecoming, and um, <clears throat> and I, I, I've just been adding things, things that I'm finding out, things that I'm learning brand new on on the blood, on the body, on the skeletal structure. Our, our entire body is is amazing. Why would anybody want to mess with it um, when God created it in such a fearful and wonderful way? In Psalm 139, we're going to read that here in a little bit. And that's going to kind of launch us into this. First thing I want to do, though, I'm going to check out how, okay, I think I got it. Um, I, I'm, I've got it. You can see there's a different look to everything. And so I'm just making sure I know which button to push and everything like that. But there is, I've got a ton of articles on our Pastor Mike Online Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online, there was a bunch of articles uh, that uh, I had gathered for today. I had some of them printed them out, was going to read them, and uh, I just kind of felt impressed to talk about the blood today, some new things that have, uh, that have come to me um, about the blood, and Smithy from India has sent me something. I, I just went, that's cool, that's cool, and I know it's right, because if you know Scripture, you know it's right, and um, so any, I don't know what I was talking about. Anyway. Um, you can see all the things that I was going to talk about today on our Pastor Mike Online Facebook page. They are all there. Some of them are kind of scary. This one, this one that I'm going to show you is scary. There is a, a real sea monster in Japan um, or out on the ocean of Japan, Fukushima, which is where they had the massive tsunami and it nearly destroyed their nuclear reactor plant, and who knows now if this is the byproduct of that. 
uh, because an, a large amount of radiation escaped from this nuclear, that's how some people say it, nuclear, this nuclear power plant in Fukushima, Japan. And if you are a fan like I am of Godzilla and all these Japanese monster movies, um, I, when I was a kid, I was a, I used to watch Ultraman, which is one of these. In Ultraman, there was this guy. He got this thing from the aliens. He'd raise it up in the air, and he would turn into this great big giant superhero so he could fight all of these great big giant monsters that came out of the ocean. All right? Um, that's Japanese for you. Anyway, there's a real live monster caught in the Fukushima area of Japan in the ocean and uh, here it is right here hey it worked look at that look at that thing this guy the, I don't know what they call this hang on a wolf fish um, is what they're calling it they apparently know what it is I have I've fished for many years of my life in lakes and streams here in Missouri I have never seen anything like this in my life um, let's see how many, how much it weighs. Uh, I don't know if it says on here, but anyway, you can see the Japanese man. Japanese people always look like they are in severe distress. And, um, he's holding this nasty, it's 1.2 meters in length. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it says how much it weighs here, but this thing is, when I looked at it, I'm going, okay, that's got to be a hoax, but I don't think it is. They know what this thing is. And it just looks creepy, nasty, and you have to ask the question, how much radiation did this thing suck on in order to be this big and this ugly? Because that's how every Japanese monster movie came about. Was The Japanese had this infatuation with radiation after, they, after we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was the Japanese that started experimenting, as far as film is concerned, with this, this thing about monsters coming up out of the ocean because there was radiation there and everything like that. It just, it's just creepy looking. Now let's see if I can get back to the main shot. Here it is right here. All right. Well, that worked out again so far. Here is, uh, <clears throat> I want to remind you about Living Waters for Kenya, hopefoundationbicm.org is the website to go to to find out more information. I'm supposed to be showing a video, um, hopefully this Sunday morning, of some of the people in Samburu County. They're listening to us live on uh, KBTR Watchman FM. And these people are, are desirous of clean water. And that is something out there that I'm telling you, it's more precious than gold. Is, clean, is having clean water, clean water to drink, clean water to bathe in, clean water to cook their meals in. It is, it is something that they fight and war over over there. And uh, we would like to try to provide, we'd like to dig a well. It's, it's very expensive, uh, probably close to, well, I won't say. I won't say. I'll let the Lord, I'll let the Lord take care of that. But it is rather pricey, and we're trying to dig one well over there that will be a public access well that anybody who needs clean water can get it. One of the issues that we deal with is the depth of which this well has to be dug. It has to go way, 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 way down there um, in order to get the groundwater out of there. And But anyway, just pray about it, and if God leads you to it, then amen, praise the Lord, and um, I hope God will bless you as a result of it. Here's a story that kind of dovetails in with what we're going to talk about today. Let me get rid of that and that. And all right, get ready here. Get ready. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to realize exactly what the Bible means when it says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're going to see it today. This, um, some of you have already seen this. I've talked about the blood before. And I, I, I just... I, you know, I, I've covered so many topics and so many issues and things and so on, and I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering why I did not see any of this earlier or even thought about it earlier. But it's a lot of times it's an issue of calling to me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And one of the things that I like the most about this ministry is that other people are examining the Scriptures just like I do, 
and they're seeing things that I never would have thought, never dreamed of. They're seeing things that I've never seen, and they share it with me, and I couldn't take the credit for it. I'm just going to be the mouth that tells everybody what it is. Um, and so I appreciate the, the folks that send me stuff. Well, Pastor, I'm sure you know this. I'm sure you already discovered this, but here it is, and I'm going, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. I've never seen that before. So I appreciate it. You guys uh, study that book and become book smart. Know the Word of God, and then look around you and use the, the knowledge that you've been given in the Word of God to understand and identify what's going on today. Uh, I would planned on doing it yesterday, but I, I fell ill yesterday afternoon. I spent about three hours on the couch yesterday in my office. Um, had church service. Had a wonderful church service last night, a wonderful Bible study. And I got done, and I was wiped. I ain't kidding you. I was tired. I said, honey, let's go home. And I went right to bed. I woke up this morning feeling a little bit better, but just tired. So I came in this morning. I was supposed to do it yesterday and recorded next week's Watchman video broadcast called The Groves. And you got to see it. I'm telling you. It, it, I never really understood why God got so upset that they planted groves. I never understood it. When you read the Word of God and you, you kind of put some here a little and there a little comes together, and you go, okay, okay, God, that's pretty good. And I've learned over the years that God doesn't just command us stuff to be hateful. He doesn't just boss us around so he can show how powerful he is and how mean he is. It's like, Mommy, can I jump up and down on the bed? No, son, you can't jump up and down on the bed. Well, why can't I? Well, Mommy knows why. Mommy knows that you're going to jump up and down until you're dizzy, and you're either going to fall and break half the furniture in the room, or you're going to fall and bust your head open. You think Mommy's just being mean. Mommy's not mean. Mommy's watching out for you. She knows what's there. She knows what's going to happen. And so God told Israel in Deuteronomy, do not plant a grove of trees near unto the altar of the Lord. Don't do it. And so everybody's going, okay, I don't get the big deal. Why can't we have like some trees over here by the tabernacle? Why can't we do it? What is this? God, are you just mean or what? God knows why. You learn to trust him and obey and then, after a while, you go, oh, that's why you didn't, I get it now. So um, I started studying the Word of God about the groves, understanding that's what took me so long. I, I spent time with it last week, early this week, put it all together. I like how it came out. I did part one today, and uh, Lindsay's working on it right now. Get it edited, get it out there, be ready for Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, Monday morning when it starts showing up on the various websites that we have, and uh, I, I think you'll like it. Uh, by the way, um, I did a, a Pastor Mike Online uh, Tuesday, and during that program, I used a copyrighted video from BuzzFeed. That's their name. Anyway, uh, it was the video of I am a Christian, but I'm not. And I used that in Pastor Mike Online, and I never thought anything about it. Um, I don't, uh, when I'm recording Pastor Mike Online, I leave out all the songs and music we play beforehand because YouTube has a conniption. Every time you send something to them that's got somebody else's music in it because they've got algorithms that sniff out music and videos that are copyrighted. And as soon as I uploaded the Pastor Mike online, YouTube analyzed it, and they said, mm. um, we're sorry, but you've used copyrighted material from BuzzFeed. So they, they took it offline. So I sent them that there's a, there's a rule that goes along with the copyright laws, the United States of America, digital copyright laws, called the Fair Use Clause. It's right next to the Santa Clause. But the Fair Use Clause says that if I have like a news or a slash educational type program and I am using copyrighted material in the course of that news slash educational program in order to give 
comment about a particular item that's in a song or a video under the under the auspices or the umbrella of a news slash educational slash comment type program, then it is it falls under what's called the fair use clause, which means that it 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 is protected from them coming after me for using their copyrighted material. Now, if I put on a dance program on YouTube, can you imagine the Pastor Mike Hogg dance program? If I put on a dance program on YouTube and I'm using copyrighted songs, then they have a right to pull it down. But in the in the situation that I used it in Tuesday, I wrote them. I, I filed a, um, a, um, an appeal with YouTube, and I told them what kind of program it was and how it was used. And when they, when they went and analyzed it, they, they released the video back, and people have watched it. Uh, so anyway, I appreciate those of you who let me know uh, um, that YouTube had pulled it down, and I think it's back up now. Here is the news story of du jour, which means the, it's French for the jour. All right. This is from Lyon, France. A French startup company working with a top government lab dun, 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 said it, it has developed in vitro, which means in a, like a test tube, human, and I'm going to use the word seed here instead of that other word. Okay, because I don't like that other word. The word seed is, is, is the Bible word. Anyway, um, it has developed human seed in a test tube, claiming a breakthrough in infertility treatment sought for more than a decade. Whereas women in the Bible who couldn't have a child, they asked God to give them one. See, do you know what makes this lab and this company that has created their own human seed makes them God? Researchers with Calistem, and I haven't looked up that website. You might look up the website. It's a French website, so you may have to pardon their French. But researchers with Calistem, K-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-M, had announced the discovery previously, but they in the French government lab, CNRS, described how it works for the first time Thursday after taking out a patent on the process. They patented, they stole God's, they stole God's technology, and now they're patenting it for themselves. They're saying, this is ours, God. We did this. And I think God's probably going, you know what? You're right. I'm going to let you have it. I think that's what's coming. They have developed seed from immature cells known as, I don't know how, to, how am I going to say this without saying that, cedatagonial cells. I don't know what that is. Anyway, anyway, which is present in all males, including boys, and under normal conditions, develop into seed cells once puberty starts. The technology must now be clinically tested, a process that is particularly painstaking for any treatment involving reproduction. Philippe Duran, the chief Calistem researcher, said the genesis of the research was, of course, the word of God. When God created Adam and... Oh, no, he didn't say that. Philippe Duran, the chief of Calistem, said the genesis of the research was indications that male fertility was declining, which he said could be attributed to environmental factors. Since, quote, at the core or the heart of the problem is the interior of the male part. He said that was what they first tried to replicate in the lab. The research team developed a bioreactor using a viscous fluid made partly of substances found in the walls of mushrooms or in crustacean shells to reproduce the conditions within the body. They first used rat cells, then monkey cells, and then human cells. The main challenge was 
reproducing in the lab a complex physiological development process that usually lasts about 72 days in a human from immature cell to seed. In each case, quote, they took the entire path they would have taken in the male part in our in vitro system, said Durang, who worked with colleagues at CNRS uh, and the elite Lyon 1 University. CNRS researcher Marie-Hélène Perard, who also helped found Calistem, said young men with cancer that could cause fertility issues later in their lives would be the first type of patient who could be helped by the process. She said their fertility could be preserved by developing mature seed from their immature cells, then freezing it. The gist of this story is that laboratories are now playing God. They are, they are developing intact human seed. And they say that it's going to help the infertile men of our planet. I can tell you that some men that I've met should probably remain infertile. But it's, that's their that's their guys. That's their their smoke screen, their cloud, their cover. Is that we're trying to help humanity? We're trying to help humanity that, in many of our eyes, is already overpopulating and using the resources of a planet that's going to be de depleted in the next maybe one to five hundred years. But we're going to help the men who now cannot have a baby. We're going to help them to have a baby. I, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I don't believe it. I don't believe that that's their end game. Their goal is to help humanity. I think this is another piece of the puzzle of how or not how we're going to create humanity because humanity has already been created. How we are going to re create humanity. Here's the verse that comes to my mind. It's in 1 Peter. I, I've read it, I, I don't know how many times. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And this, this is why I say to people, let's read this old book. Don't go, you don't need a new Bible. We're not done with the old one yet. Let's, let's get this old book out and read it and know what it says, and then look at it with fresh eyes. I mean, stop and think about it. Let, let me read 1 Peter 1, verse 23. And it's in an interesting place, too. Because the man donates, at conception, the man donates 23 chromosomes. 23 of the 46 needed. The woman, the wife, donates the other 23. And they Join together, and now you have 46, and it's just exactly what God designed. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, he talks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And I'm, I submit to you that they are in the process of creating corruptible seed. That's what they're doing. That's the end game. That's the... That's what they're trying to conceal by saying, we're trying to help infertile men. Well, if anybody needs to be infertile, it's probably the French. Minus the French Canadians. But they're, they're, they're making, they're learning how to make a new super seed. Remember, the fourth kingdom is going to have the ability to mingle themselves with the seed of men. See, I've been using that term, reading this story, because that's what it is. The Bible calls it seed. And these fourth kingdom people, a nation from afar, from the north, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, a nation whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. They are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. Mankind 
is approaching a day when they are, there is going to be a, a rebirth of humanity. I believe that it coincides with and mirrors perfectly the transformation that the Bible speaks of that you and I are going to be a part of. When the, tr when the last trump sounds, the dead are going to be raised incorruptible, and we are going to be changed from mortal to immortality, from corruption to incorruption. While this world then experiences a rebirth of its own. But it's a rebirth that guarantees and secures the second death. Not the second birth or the second life, but the second death. That's what I think is going on in this world today. And, and again, you look at 1 Peter 1.23 and you look at that and then you ask yourself like 40, 50 years ago, how could, how could anybody have ever imagined that they would have the ability to create seed in a laboratory, in a test tube. Nobody but the most far out, weird science fiction writers. The guy, it was a Frenchman, the, the island of Dr. Moreau. I can't remember his name right offhand, but he wrote that. And the island of Dr. Moreau was all about this guy, Dr. Moreau, experimenting with animal-human hybrids. And only the weirdest of weird people ever imagined anything like this 40, 50, 75, 100 years ago and beyond that. But now we're seeing it. We're seeing it with our own eyes. And we go back to our Bibles and we go, okay, I get that now. I, I think I know what that's talking about. I think I know what this really means. And we're looking at the Bible with fresh eyes. Psalm 139 is one of those places now that we're able to see it for what it really is. Psalm 139. Um, let's pick it up in verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, R-E-I-N-S. You know what I think that means? I think God is the one who pulls our strings and tells us which way to go. That, just, like, just like a rider on a horse, he possesses the reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And the more that I learn about how this body works and how it was made, uh, the more in awe I stand at the feet of God's holy word when it dawns on me, this is that which was spoken. And some of you are doing the very same thing, and I appreciate it. I, I like getting, again, I like getting these emails where, Pastor, you may have already seen this, but, and in some cases, I've already seen it. And I always say, yeah, I, I knew that. Um, it's not a contest. Who saw it first? Okay? There's not an extra cookie waiting for me that you're not going to get when we get in heaven. I'll give you my cookie if you want it. All right? It's not a contest. Who can come up with it first? It's not a contest who can get the popularity out of it. Some people can think things that I don't think. They send it to me, and I'm going, okay, that's cool. I never would have thought of that. I'll just be the mouthpiece for it. But I like the fact that people are sending things. Sometimes I've already seen it, and I say, you know what? I already saw that, but I appreciate you giving me a second witness because I never spoke on that, and you found the exact same thing. I'll never forget the preacher who called me one day about a year or two ago. And he said, Pastor, I've, been, I've watched your video, Jesus Christ DNA and the Holy Bible. He said, I'm down here in Alabama. And he said, um, he said I'm, I'm going to run something by you. And he said, I don't want you to think I'm crazy. I said, okay, go. No, he, you know, I, I'm going to correct that. He had not seen the DNA video I made. I don't know which one he saw, but he had not seen the DNA video. And he said, I'm going to run something by you. He said, and in Psalm 139, he says, in thy book all my members were written, which in continuous fashion when as yet there was none of them. And he said, now, don't think I'm weird. He said, but I think that that book is DNA, and I think the DNA book is, is what God wrote, and it makes all of us who we are. And there was a long pause on the phone because I'm just going, yeah, I already know that, but I'm going, okay, let, let me ask you a question. I said, have, I did a video called Jesus Christ DNA and the Holy Bible. I said, have you seen that video? And he said, no, I've never seen it. I said, let me tell you something. Let me make your day. I said, I not only agree with you that that's what it means, 
I made a video on it, and you're going to like it. And he was a King James guy, and he said, you just don't find the reading of Psalm 139, 16. You don't find it in other translations. It's not there the way it is in the King James. And so I, I got him to go look at that, and praise the Lord. He saw it independent of me telling him what was there, which means, number one, he was doing what I was doing, what others are doing. They're looking at this Bible with fresh eyes. Now that we know a little bit more about how the universe works, we're able to see those things are already clearly in the Word of God. Psalm 139, 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. When I was uh, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. But I will tell you, that the womb of the woman matches the heart of the earth. Think about, um, think about where the where the beast comes from. He comes up through the sea. You know how we're you know what we're surrounded by when we are in the the uterus of a woman, the womb. Do you know what we're surrounded by? A sea, an ocean, salt water, and we are literally born of water. Just like what separates us from the lowest parts of the earth, there's a vast ocean underneath our feet. Humongous amounts of water. How do we know this? Because the Bible tells us this in Genesis chapter 7. That's where most, I would say most of the water that covered the earth came from the heart of the earth, came from that underground ocean. So I don't know exactly what it means that we were curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. I just know that the womb of the woman is a picture of the lowest parts of the earth. That's what I know. Now, verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfected. Unperfect is the word. And God sees our substance even before it was made. That's because our God is a God of prophecy. Our God can see into the future. Our God can declare things that have not happened yet that will happen. And so God declared how, think about this, um, the Duggars and the Bates and all these other families that have, I don't know, 15, 20 children apiece. You'll notice that as you look at those children, all of them bear a resemblance but no two of them look exactly alike. And that's because there is an innumerable number of ways that the male and the female chromosomes can come together and form a child. A family that has two, three, four, five, even more than that children, they will be able to see little pieces of mom and little pieces of dad in that child and they look at the other child, and they see another little piece of dad and mom in that child. And no two are quite the same, but there are similarities. And that's because there is such a, a wide range of genetics to go through that a child could be born with this, or a child could be born with that, and so on. Think of Jacob and Esau. Those two are complete opposites one another. Jacob was sort of fair, probably pale, liked to hang around mama and learn how to cook, while Esau was out there smoking cigars and sitting under a tree killing deer with his bare hands and had and smelled like a deer. Two completely different guys. The genetics just mixed differently. And so here's what I think. I think when God put me together in the lowest parts of the earth, in the secret place of the womb of my mother, God chose exactly the genetic traits that were in my father, the genetic traits that were in my mother, those that had came from her bloodline, those that came from my dad's bloodline, and put them together and made me exactly what I am today. God wrote my book. So he said, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, or were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And that is, that is the process of 
the development of a human. Uh, there's a BBC documentary. I've watched part one on YouTube, and I'm just now getting into part two. But when, when the scientist, it's called the cell. I think it's in three parts. When the scientists first started looking through these little microscopes, these very rudimentary microscopes, they thought that life just spontaneously erupted. They thought that rotten meat turned into maggots. They didn't know that flies deposited eggs on that rotten meat so the maggots would have something to eat so they could grow and turn into flies. That was the thinking of the day. And they started looking through these microscopes and they saw cells. And they saw cells divide. And those cells divided again and again and again and again. And they realized that if they saw a cell, that cell didn't just erupt out of nothing. That cell came from a previous cell. This is the 1800s, and it's revolutionized medicine. And it took a while for it to catch on because most of these scientists had believed that life just spontaneously erupted. And so then, then a guy's looking at his own seed in a microscope, very rudimentary microscope. And he sees the, the little tadpole-looking thing for the first time. And he's going, this is where we come from. And his imagination was such, they didn't really understand about the whole DNA and chromosomes yet. This is the 1800s. And so there is a, they, they show a picture on here of an early drawing of what a male seed looked like. And they visualized that in the head of this seed was, was, a, was a formed baby that was this tall, this big. And that eventually that formed baby, fully formed baby, grew and grew and grew the way it did inside of a mother's womb. Boy, did they have that wrong. They couldn't see yet because you can't see DNA. It's too small. They didn't see that inside of that man's seed was only half the story, that the woman had the other half. And they didn't see that rather than it being the, the tiny little body of a baby, it was nothing but a book. They didn't see that back then. And yet here's David writing about it, a thousand years before Jesus came along the scene, three thousand years before Watson and Crick discovered the makeup of DNA. Here's David writing about it by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, because after all, it was God that created it that way. He made us all out of a book in contends for a fashion when as yet there was none of them. This and, and verse 17. I never read this verse when I'm talking about DNA, but I like it. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And you know, I kind of think that God's thoughts of me are written down in a book that we call deoxyribonucleic acid. God's thoughts about me are basically what God knows about me. And how does God know so much about me? Because he wrote the book. He wrote the book of Mike Hoggard. We're gonna let's talk about blood. When I made the homecoming uh, videos about the human body, um, I, I I basically a week and a half before homecoming, I had it in my mind kind of what I was going to be doing about a month or so before homecoming. But I sat down literally and I thought I'm going to do something on blood, but. I don't know anything about blood other than just, you know, little bits here and there. So I started putting it together. I thought it was cool, and I presented it, and everybody thought it was cool. But I, I wasn't done. Because at the time, I was telling everybody, there's two main components to human blood. White blood cells, red blood cells. There's more to it than that. So let's kind of look at blood. Let's see if I can pull this up. Oh, look at there. Here we go. There we go. That kind of looks cool, doesn't it? Okay. Um, here's, here's what blood is. Um, and a guy made me this background, this graphic here, and I kind of like it. 
Uh, Wirecast lets me see how much of my computer resources are being taken up. And it's, it's quite a lot. This, this computer is processing so much information right now. So I may have to change the background a little bit uh, so the computer's not chugging away too hard. But anyway, here's, here's the verse. Leviticus 17, 13, And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. And God's telling Israel, don't drink the blood. Isn't it interesting that out of all of the things that the Jerusalem Council could have told the Gentile believers to do, one of them, there was only four things, one of them was abstain from blood. Don't drink blood. Don't eat blood sausage, you Britons. Don't um, read the Twilight novels or be a vampire, or go to a Catholic church, or a Lutheran church that teaches transubstantiation. Do not eat flesh offered to idols, which is the Eucharist in the Catholic church, because they stand right before those pic that statue of dead Jesus and offer this holy, holy sun god thing that we're going to turn it literally into meat in front of an idol, and he said, don't eat that and don't drink the blood. That's what we were told not to. And the whole Catholic Church is based upon a violation of at least three of the four commandments given to us as Gentile believers. Don't eat anything strangled, meaning hanging from a tree. And there's Jesus on the crucifix. Don't drink the blood. Well, they've they're, they're got blood. And don't eat food sacrificed to idols. And the priest sacrifices Jesus every time, or a Jesus, every time in front of a statue, an idol. That's the Catholic Church for you right there. Everything that we were told not to do, they said, now this is what you do and this is how you get salvation. If you eat this, then you'll have salvation until the next time that you have to eat it again. Not everlasting salvation, not what the Bible says. Anyway, don't drink the blood for it is the life of all flesh. He said, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And God wasn't kidding with that one. He said, don't eat or drink the blood because it is the life. Uh, so here's God's signature in the blood. There are four blood types. You have A, B, a, B, and O. Now, here's what's interesting. In Exodus 24, Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant. And so he sprinkled blood on the book and on the people and on the tabernacle and, on, and cleansed it with blood. In Hebrews 12, he says, To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. In other words, the blood of the covenant of the Old Testament, which was animal's blood, was not as good as the blood of Jesus sprinkling on a new covenant. So there's a New Testament, a new way, and it's the gospel way. So we have a pattern in the Bible. You see it everywhere. That anytime you have four things... Three of them are going to be the same, and one of them is going to be significantly different. Think of, um, think of um, Rachel, Leah, Billa, and Zillah. Out of the four, who was the real true love of Jacob? It was Rachel. She's different than the other three. Think of, um, think of um, um, the, the uh, parable of the seed of the sower. You have the seed going to four different groups, wayside, stony ground, thorny ground, good ground. Which one's different than the other three? The good ground is different because it's the only one that produces fruit. The other three don't. So then compare your, your, your gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke are the synoptic gospels. They say the same things. They talk about the same stories. They have the same basic outline from beginning to end which has led some of, this, some of these learned 
uh, elite scholars who know more than everybody else to think that there must have been some other manuscript that they call Q, the letter Q, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke probably copied from. I heard about that in Bible college, and I'm just going, really? Do we really have to learn about this? Because I don't think that's right. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels because they're similar. John's different. Anybody who reads the four gospels know that John's different. John begins different. He talks about different stories, different things that Jesus said. It's different than the other three. Now, when you look at the four blood types, A, B, and A, B, and then O, three of those are the same, and one of them's different. And what's different is O, because O is the universal donor. Anybody who needs blood can receive blood from a O positive donor, because an O an A donor can only donate to an A recipient or an AB recipient. A B donor can only donate to a B or a B or an AB recipient, but a B cannot donate to A or O. But an O blood type, they're called the universal donor because anybody who needs blood can get it from an O blood type because an O can donate to A, B, A, B, or O. And there's, there's your picture there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Leah, Bila, Bila, Zilla, Rachel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah's different. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the Son of God. The Son of God's different. And here's Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. You know what I think? I think the O blood type represents the blood of Jesus because anybody can receive the O blood. It's different than the other three. Isn't that neat? Isn't that cool? Christ didn't just die and shed his blood for his own people, Israel. He didn't just shed his blood and die for all the white Caucasian people of the world. He shed his blood for everybody. God designed it that way. That is so neat. Christ didn't just die for one race. He died and shed his blood so that everybody could benefit from the donated blood of Jesus, the Son of God. That is, that's cool. Amen. Now, when I first did this, I had up here the two components of blood. Blood, blood, blood. And that's all I knew at the time. This was um, August 1st, July 31st, August 1st, August 2nd. And since then, I've come to realize, and especially today, see this one down here on platelets? This is what Smithy from India sent me. And where do you see it? I made, I made for time's sake, I'm going to have to skip over a lot of this presentation. But I am going to show you the new stuff that I found about blood. We're going to talk about red cells, white cells, plasma, and platelet platelets. When I, again, when I presented this back in August, I, there, I said there's two main parts of blood. I wasn't considering the plasma. I wasn't considering the platelets either. So now there's four components of blood. Let's, uh, how many blood types were there? Four. How many gospels are there? Four. So it's interesting. And I, if somebody's listening to me out there and you know of something I'm missing on the blood, send it to me. Tell me what it is. Tell me what it does. Tell me how it works and do it in layman's terms. Because if I can understand it in layman's terms, that's how I'm going to present it is in layman's terms. Because not all of us are doctors or molecular biologists or nurses. We don't all have that gift. And so I like to present it as easy. So present, make me believe it. 
and then I'll try to help others believe it. Let's look at let's look at what I left off first. Plasma. Because your red, your white cells, and your platelets, they all are in your blood. We see we call it the blood what? Stream. We call it that for a reason. I'll show you why. The red and the white cells and the platelets don't just move around on ox carts or they don't take the subway. They don't walk around on stilts and they don't have little bitty spider legs. Thank God for that. Red cells and white cells and platelets move around in the body by way of plasma. Plasma accounts for most of your blood volume, about 55% of what comes, and when you cut yourself, 55% of what comes out is plasma. Plasma itself is made of 95% water. And we call it the blood stream. It's what carries the red and the white cells in the platelets. It's the medium that carries waste products to be excreted from the body. When your body takes something in and uses, burns it or whatever, it's got waste products. Some of that is blown out in the air when we exhale. The rest of it is carried by the blood to like the kidneys, or maybe to the bowels. I don't know. I don't know all that much about it. I just know the bowels and the kidneys are where the excreted stuff goes out. And so we have this 95% water, subs. the rest of it's like proteins and things like that. That's why it doesn't look completely clear like water. It's kind of like a yellowish. You wouldn't want to drink it, okay? You wouldn't want to drink it. But anyway, it, it floats around in this stream in our body of 95% water. And here's what's What's really interesting, this dawned on me one day. I was looking at the, the cracks on my skin, on my hand. And if you ever look at, like, your skin up close and you see all the cracks and see all the little crevices in there. And then if you look at ground, bare ground, that at one time was moist with water and it, the water's all dried up, what happens? What happens to the ground? It cracks and if you compare the cracks of dry ground to, like, dry skin on the back of your hand, they're almost an identical match. Do you know why? Well, I'll tell you why. The reason why is, is that when we look at the ground and how it gets all parched and chapped and things like that, we need to remember one thing and one thing very, very important. That's what we were made out of. We were made out of the dust of the earth. And so there is an amazing similarity between how our body is made and designed and the look of our body. There's an amazing connection between that and the earth. Right down to the vascular system. The vascular system is where our blood flows and all the arteries, veins, capillaries and the vascular system that the plasma flows through looks exactly like this look at that here's the vascular system of your hand here is the vascular system of the earth and i want you to ponder this i want you to think about this for a minute rivers flow across the land. And what do these rivers do? They provide nourishment. They provide sustenance. I can tell you, uh, my dad worked the Mississippi River. He was a dredging inspector for the Corps of Engineers. He used to take me on the, the dredge Kennedy that he worked on. And I used to float the Mississippi River with him. I, I, I love the river. I love being on the river. And I can tell you some of the most fertile ground in the United States of America is alongside the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, the Ohio River. All of these river systems in this country, they produce some of the most fertile ground. When they're not flooded, 
If you come to the St. Louis area and you come from the east, you're going to go across the Jefferson Barracks Bridge, the JB Bridge, from Illinois into uh, Missouri, and you're going to look both ways, and you're going to see this farmland right next to the river. And it's, I mean, it is amazingly fertile. It's got all those nutrients that come in from the river. Dead fish stuff is laying there, and those farmers, they take a chance every year. If they don't get flooded, then the crops they raise are going to be absolutely amazing. So the river, that's what it does. By the way, it's, the rivers are meant for the cleansing of the land. Because what happens when the rain comes down, it washes everything that's on the ground, and all of that stuff flows to the river, and it's carried out. And that's what your bloodstream does. And isn't it amazing that the arteries and the veins and the capillaries of our bodies match perfectly the look and the design of a, they even call it a river and its arterial system because of how it looks and what it looks like. Here's the arterial system of a river. In other words, all of these little things feed into the big river. And so does, that's the way this looks too. It's the same thing. Why? Because we were made from this earth. <laughs> I'm just, now, can you imagine? Can you imagine? And we can, we can see this in the Bible. My father and mother from this planet were made from this planet. And so I not only look like my mother and father, but I look like this earth. Think of our new birth. We have literally the seed of God growing in us. Heaven being our mother. This is why we cannot even fathom in our minds what we are going to look like when our new birth finally, finally comes to pass, when we die and shed off this body and are remade in God's image, the image of our Father, God, the image of Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, which is the mother of us all, this is why we cannot even fathom what we're going to, how we're going to appear. But we know we're going to be like Jesus. As amazing as almost said, as amazing as my body looks, as amazing as our bodies look being made after the fashion of this earth, what's our new body going to look like? Fearfully and wonderfully made we are. Now watch this. First place in the Bible. First place in the Bible you find a river. It's in Genesis chapter 2. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from, it, from thence it was parted and it became into four heads. Look at there. Look at there. Look, your, your heart is where the river stops and starts. And it parts, it's got four parts to it the left atrium, the right atrium, the left ventricle, the right ventricle. By the way, th three of those are the same, one of them's different. I can't remember. Uh, how it is. I'll have to go back and relearn that. But three of these chambers are identical, and one of them is different. I think the one difference is, um, I'm thinking it's the right ventricle that carries the oxygenated blood into the body. I think that's how it works. All right? M maybe somebody knows something different. But there's only one of those ventricles that actually carries and pushes the blood back into our bodies. The left atrium and ventricle and right atrium, I think that's how it works, are the ones who take it from the body, send it to the lungs to get oxygenated, and then there's one chamber that provides that life to the rest of the body. We didn't come from monkeys, people. We didn't come from monkeys. Don't believe that nonsense. Don't believe that lie. The more, the more we find out as a species about how our body works and the mechanisms of everything that's alive in us, the more we should realize that we didn't happen just randomly. We were created by God in his image, in his likeness. That's how we were made. 
So think about these places in the Bible that talk about a river. Psalm 46, 46, by the way, 46 chromosomes. Psalm 46 says, there is a river. The streams thereof or whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Psalm 65, 9, thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Listen, we are an extension of this earth. And God has, just like God puts rivers on the earth, he has put a river in us that waters our body. When you drink, like I, I have to when I'm doing this program, I got to stop and drink every now and then. You know why? Because I'm blowing a lot of my moisture out of my mouth. This is why you don't want to be standing near me while I'm preaching, okay? Because I'll spit on you. Standing close to me while I'm preaching is like going to a Gallagher concert, if you remember that guy, okay? And the sledgehammer that he used to mash watermelons with or whatever. That's what it's like. Anyway. When I drink, that water goes into my body, and it's carried around in my plasma, my, my river system, and every cell in my... By the way, the cells of your body produce water as a byproduct of what it is that they do. I don't remember how it works, but every cell in your body actually produces a small amount of water, and that goes right back into the arterial system, the blood system, the plasma. But every now and then we need more, so we drink water. If we don't drink water, what happens to us? We die. What happens to the land if it doesn't rain? It dies, just like we do. Everything needs water, people. And God put a river system inside of us. He visited the earth, and he waters the earth. And it's called the river of God, and it is full of water. Psalm 78, 44, and had turned their rivers. Look at that. <laughs> look, at, look what God did. He turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. Look at that. I saw that, and I'm just going, oh, wow. It's a match with what God has done on the inside of us. Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. <laughs> he turneth it whithersoever he will. This is us. John seven thirty eight. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And people said, wow, what a great metaphor. What, a, what an awesome spiritual understanding that is that doesn't really exist. Because some people look at the Bible and say, yeah, that's a metaphor, or that's a spiritual thing that God says. He means it in a spiritual way, which to them means it doesn't really exist. But if we think it in our minds then that's really all the substance that it is. And I don't believe that. I think this Bible is more real and right than anything in this world. And I think when I look at the Bible and I see something spiritual, I think it literally means of a spiritual nature in the spiritual realm of spirits, by spirits, for spirits. That's what I think. I think literally. I think literally. There is a river of living water flowing out of, I, I would think maybe our belly would include just our entire area here, okay? Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And that's our plasma that God put inside of us. I like this one. Hang on got to replenish here. Genesis 2.10, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and came into four heads. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7, this is the cycles 
that I that I preach on every now and then, the cycles of Christian growth. If you have not seen that video, I encourage you, strongly encourage you to go watch it. Because God helped me a long time ago because I wondered why there were times when it seemed like I was more spiritual than in other times. There was times when I felt like I was closer to God than at other times. There was times when the devil would confront me with some sort of temptation or something like that, and I would, I'd say, devil, get away from me. I don't do that stuff anymore. Get away from me. March on. Be gone, you devil. And then there were times when I just fell right into it. And I thought that it was the failure of me trying to live a Christian life, telling myself, Mike, you just are not cut out to be a Christian. Maybe you should just go leave. And I, I struggled. I mean, I struggled with why I wasn't being righteous and holy before God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The Holy Ghost dealt with me one day. I, was, I mean, I was down at the altar praying by myself, nobody around here but me, bawling my eyes out before God. And this idea of cycles came to me. And I started thinking about it. And then I started looking at the scriptures. Ecclesiastes talks about this water cycle. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return. Then I remembered the tree planted by the rivers of living water that brought forth fruit in his season. And God did not intend for us to put out fruit nonstop all the time. We are like the world that we are created in. We have seasons. We have times. There is a time to plant. There is a time to harvest. There is a time when God will set us aside and he will deal with us and he'll give us the word of God to be planted inside of our souls, inside of our life. But God isn't expecting us to immediately turn and change everything about our life now, now that we know this verse. God doesn't expect that. You know who he is, according to James? He's the patient husbandman who's waiting for the harvest time. So I began to realize that there were times in my life when I was going to be more fruitful than other times. You see in the book of Judges, they're going through that cycle all the time. They're serving the Lord. God's blessing them. And because God blessed them, they became wealthy. And because they became wealthy, they got lazy on God. And because they got lazy, then they started turning sinful. And because they turned sinful, they started justifying their sins with other gods who would let them sin. And when they got to that point, God would put them under cruel authority. And after seven years or 20 years or 40 years, it was different. But after a while, Israel got tired of it. And they began to cry out to God, and God sent them a savior, raised up a judge and sent them a savior and saved them from their enemies. And the cycle started all over again. You can go, you can go through the whole book of Judges and see that one after another. But think about this. Ecclesiastes 1, seven. all the rivers run into the sea and yet the sea is not full. And the four heads there represent your heart, where the water comes into and where it goes out of. It cycles. It's called a circulation. It's what it is. It's got the word circle in it because your body circulates this river constantly going going from one place to another constantly in a big circle it's called circulation how's this circulation doing all circulation did pretty good and he says all the rivers run into the sea and isn't it interesting there's that pericardium there that pericardium is a sea that surrounds the four chambers of your heart just like you see in Ecclesiastes 1, 7. All the rivers run into the sea. And there it is, people. You were, you were made by the book. That's how you were made. Now, um, I'm going to run through this really fast because I want to get to uh, what was sent to me from India about the platelets. I, just, I read it. I instantly accepted it. I'm going, oh, why didn't I come up with that? God, 
Why didn't you give me that? And God says, like, I did. It's in an email. Doesn't matter who gets the credit. Doesn't matter who came up with it. Doesn't matter. What matters is that we send forth the message and people believe it. And I'm telling you, I, you know, here's what I think. I think that you would have an easier time approaching someone with the gospel, with stuff like this, Maybe then, then, and maybe everybody's different. I understand that. But I know that if, I, if, if I'm talking to somebody and I say, hey, can I show you something? And I get a pen and a piece of paper and I start drawing DNA. And I start making this little ladder of DNA and showing them how it works. And then I show them, here's the Old Testament, here's the New Testament, here's the four Gospels. And this makes a language that's written in 22 amino acids. Those are the letters of the genetic alphabet. And by the way, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet in the Old Testament. And then I start giving them all these things from the Bible. In thy book, all thy members were written. And people, people, I've had people look at that and go, that is absolutely amazing. My mind is just reeling right now. Because you, know you know what they've just learned? They've just learned that maybe everything that they accepted from science could be wrong and that there really is a God and he really did write a book and he really did make us in his image and he has an expectation out of us. So instead of, I know some people just need beat over the head with their sins. I get that. But maybe a better tactic to try on some people is to not beat them over the head with how sinful they are, maybe you could just introduce God in a fresh way, showing them the body, the blood, the DNA, the framework that God has given. Show them the temple. Show them Revelation 4 and show them the temple in their body. Maybe they'll go, you know what? I think I believe that. You just never know. You never know what who you run into. Let's look at the white and red blood cells. Isn't it cool? Isn't it cool that the blood is always linked to wine in the Bible? And there's red and white wine. He took the cup which he had when he had given thanks. He gave it to them, and and they drank all drank of it. And he said unto them, "This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many." It's because Jesus is the universal donor. His blood can be applied to the worst of all sinners, and it doesn't matter what race or what nation they come from. His blood can be applied to all. And here we have red and white blood cells, and we have red and white wine. I don't think that's by accident. I think God designed it that way. So here's the doctrine of the blood. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And I'm telling you, God has blood. God has it. Because I ran into a little controversy years ago from a former pastor of this church. My pastor, when I was eight years old, Wrote a, wrote, he's now this great theologian, the exalted Greek scholar who knows more than anybody. And he writes this article saying, it's not really Jesus' blood. The blood's nothing. The blood is a metaphor, or he used the word metonym, which means a different name for death. Anytime you see blood in the Bible, it just simply means death. Well, if it does, God would have wrote it that way, you knuckleheads. There's people who, who, John MacArthur, I don't know if he still teaches this, but at one time he taught that it's not the blood. It's simply the death of Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what atones for our sins. And that's not what the Bible says. These guys say God doesn't have blood. When Jesus was on the earth, his blood was like any other bodily fluid. That he, You ought to hear these people talk. It's insane. They talk about his blood's no different than his sweat or his spit or his urine. I'm just shaking my head going, I can't believe these people pastor churches. I just can't believe people like this are in Christianity who read the Bible and don't believe it because they've got this exalted Greek study 
that tells them something different than what you and I know and believe. And I'm t- and you know what they do with this verse, Acts chapter 20, verse 28? It says, um, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. You know what they do with this? They don't like how that's written. They've already got their doctrine that says Christ's blood was nothing. Just normal human blood. And then they draw out this analogy. Well, if we could say that Christ's blood was divine, then maybe we could say his spit was divine, and his sweat was divine, and his urine was divine. And I'm just going, what is wrong with you people? So you know what they do with this verse? This verse contradicts their doctrine. Well, they can't have that. They can't change their doctrine to fit the verse. So they change the verse. You know what they do? They say, in the original Greek language, this phrase, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, when you look at the original Greek, it really leads the idea to purchased with the blood of his own son. That's what it really, 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 really says in the original Greek. It really says purchased with his son's own blood. So all they do is just add one word that, number one, is not in the Greek. It's not there. But they took this extrapolation. They did what a lot of people do with a, with a Strong's concordance or any kind of concordance of the Bible, Greek, Greek or Hebrew. They take... And they find that this word in the Greek is related and comes from this word way over here. So they jump over there to that word, and they find like the 13th possible definition of that word. And they say, what this really means is this right here. And I used to do that. I know how it works. I know, I know why they do it. Because they would rather make you believe that your Bible's wrong than for you to think that they are wrong. It's all about pride and ego, people all about pride and ego. And so rather than believe that God has blood, they just simply change the Bible so now God doesn't have blood. That's what it says. And I'm not going to trample on the blood of God that redeems my soul, much more than being now justified by his death. That's what they want you to believe. Now it says blood justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, let's take this this possible definition that blood actually means death, and let's go back to old Moses. Moses is going to cleanse and sanctify the law book, the tabernacle, and all the furnishings, and the people. If we were to say that the word blood simply is a metonym for death, then it would stand to reason that when Moses stood in front of the congregation and he's going to sanctify both the people in the book and the tabernacle with the blood, which means death, then it would stand to reason then that Moses took chunks of meat from a dead animal and threw it on everybody, and threw it on the tabernacle, and took chunks of dead meat and threw it on the book and said, there, I sanctified it. And all these people have got dead meat, rotten meat hanging from them. That's stupid. And so are the people who believe that. We are justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. But now Christ Jesus, who ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the, not the dead riding carcass of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, which is God's blood. And it's, by the way, it's everlasting blood. That's what makes it different. You know, you know, like if we get blood on something and we don't wipe it up, what happens? It doesn't remain blood. There's something, I've got to show you this in a minute. I'm looking at my time. There's something in that blood that makes it dry and hard. And all you got is this dried crust on whatever you've 
you know, spill the blood on. So we know, we know, we know for a fact that Christ offered his blood on the mercy seat of God in heaven. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see scales of dried blood on the mercy seat of God. Because Christ's blood is everlasting. Colossians 1.14, who we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.20, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Hebrews 9.11, but Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. By, by the way, by his own blood, his own blood, there's two places in the Bible where it says that. Here, his own blood, and here, his own blood. Same phrase. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It's the blood, people. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Go read Genesis 4. Because Genesis 4, God heard Abel's blood speak. Go read it. Hebrews 13, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, not the dried, scaly blood of the old covenant, the blood of an everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. First Peter 1.18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with, look here, corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Isn't that cool? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. I, I think that devils, bad, mean, evil, hateful spirits, I think that they don't like the blood of Christ in your life. They don't like it. Why do I think that? Uh, well, number one, if we walk in the light, see the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses from all sin. And then on the day of Passover, God released a destroying spirit, bad, mean, evil spirit. And that spirit was programmed to do one thing. That was to go in every house, find the firstborn, and kill it, except in a house that had blood on the doorpost and the lintel, the head of the door. When that spirit saw that blood, that spirit never went past that door. Everybody who was then on the inside of that house was safe. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over thee. And I think evil, mean, nasty, bad spirits don't like the blood of Christ. Revelation 1, 5, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He washed us from our sins in his blood. How does that work? Let's look at white blood cells. I want to skip through some of this. Okay, here we go, here we go. No, not there yet, not there yet, not there yet. All that stuff is cool. If you haven't seen that, you got to go, you got you to watch it, okay? All right, now, 
white blood cells, and then platelets. That's what we're going to get to today, the white blood cells. Here's what they look like, okay? That's a pimple. That's a zit. And what happens is when I was a teenager, um, they, te- they tell you this, you know, you're, you're going, you're growing leaps and bounds as a teenager. As a, at your post-adolescent, you're, you're now in your puberty and your body's growing. And the skin is stretching to accommodate the growth of your, of your body. And in order for that skin to stretch well, the body releases oil. It makes your face and your head real shiny, okay? And that oil is on your skin. And your body, your skin, has all these oil sacs under the pores of your skin. And those pores open and release that oil. And it goes, all, covers your, keeps your skin nice and, nice and stretchy. But what happens is now that that doorway is open to let that oil out, that doorway is also open and dirt or some sort of unclean thing will get in that pore of that cell or that of your skin. And the moment that that unclean thing comes into your skin, your white blood cells this is what they do, and they do it very well. They go find it, and they start attacking it. And one of the white blood cells, hey, we need some more white blood cells over here. And all of a sudden now, there's a bunch of white blood cells jumping into the pool. And that's what you see when you're looking at that pimp. When I was a teenager, I used to have them all on my face. I had get great big ones on my nose because I have great big pores on my nose, okay? Most of you will never get close enough to see that, thank God. But I used to get these massive zits, these pimples on my nose because those pores were big and dirt was getting in there and my body was getting rid of that uncleanness. So I used to stand in front of the mirror like, I remember those days? And mash all those white blood cells get them out and then you then you got a big bloody sore that looks real good on picture day anyway but that's what that is that is part of your blood when we think of blood when you cut herself you don't see white blood cells you see red blood cells that's what you see but the white blood cells are still there and it's only when something unclean comes into the body, that's when you see it. That's when you really see it work, okay? And there's a teaching about this. I'm going through it through my mind. I'm not ready to to say it yet. But, I mean, it's cool. So whenever Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once, uh, once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements, there was blood that was applied to a sin offering. And it is the most holy unto the Lord. In Leviticus 16, he shall go out into the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock, the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with the finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. I mean, look at that. White blood cells seek out uncleanness. Whether it's dirt that got into your pores or some germ, some bacteria, your white blood cells travel up and down the river looking for a chance to jump on some uncleanness. That's what you're, that, and that's how you're sanctified. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? White blood cells 
kill unclean things. Now, here's the process. I like this. The white blood cells look for an uncleanness. That's what sin is. It's uncleanness. When it finds it, it covers it completely. Wow. Covered by the blood. My uncleanness, my sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ represented by the white blood cells. Then once it's covered the sins, this is where it gets good. And I, I didn't have time to put these verses in here because I, I thought about it after I did the presentation. And I'm going, boy, you know, I should have put the verses in there. You remember what God did to Rahab? Not Rahab the harlot in, in uh, Jericho. But God, the Bible says that God took Rahab, that piercing serpent, and broke him in pieces, cut him in pieces. All through the Bible, you'll see God dashed his enemies, how? In pieces. He broke them into pieces. Remember what happens to the fourth kingdom. The stone, cut without hands, crashes down on the ten toes of the image, and the image crumbles, and it crumbles literally into pieces, and is blown away like the chaff off the summer threshing floor, the Bible says. So white blood cells, when they find uncleanness, the first thing they do is cover it. And I think there's a teaching there that says God wants to put a stop to uncleanness in your life to keep it from consuming your entire being. I think that's a good teaching there. God covers your sin and sort of like traps it and imprisons it to keep it from going any farther. Isn't that good? Aren't you glad God did that for you? Aren't you glad that God didn't take you and strip you down in front of everybody in the world? to show how rotten you really are? No, what he did was he came to you and you alone, and he said, I'm going to cover your sins so that nobody can see them ever again. That, that is, uh, turn your Bibles to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So once it covers it, then, oh, you're going to like this. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. I don't have this verse up here, but you're going to see it, okay? Once the sin is covered by the white blood cell, then the white blood cell begins to dismantle and tear apart into pieces that unclean piece of dirt, okay? Once it covers it, once it breaks it in pieces, you know what it does next? It consumes it so that it doesn't exist anymore. Look in Second Thessalonians 2. In verse, we know this is about the man of sin, the son of perdition, right? In verse 7, the Bible says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. In verse 8, now that we have the wicked revealed, now the man of sin has been revealed, the wicked, the, the unclean thing. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall... Look at that next word there and tell me what that word says. Consume. It, it's so neat. The Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with what? The brightness, the white blood cells. He shall destroy with the brightness of his coming.
coming. <laughs> In fact, look at look at Revelation. I turned right to it. Revelation 19. We're gonna, there are two places in Revelation 19 we're going to look at. What time have I got? All right, I got time. Revelation 19, um, verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. White horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. How did it get white and clean? It was dipped in the blood. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. See, the, the, the wicked one is, re, is consumed by the mouth of the Lord. And what's in the mouth? It's his sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the, the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now turn to the beginning of Revelation 19. And... Um, we see in verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice to give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You look that up in another translation. And all these other translations, these people are so ignorant. They put in here, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints, or the righteous acts of the saints. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like masonry, and they wear that lambskin covering over their loins, and the masons taught that when he gets to heaven, stand before God, when God sees him, his lambskin apron, all white, and uh, he's got all those Masonic emblems on it, then God knows that this is a righteous man because the lambskin apron represents the righteousness of of a mason, the righteous deeds and the righteous acts of a very good man. And God says, oh, you're a mason. Yeah, come on in. Come on in. Yeah, it's like free for masons. Masons can come on in. Said God, never! By the way, you know what masons are? Wolves in sheep's clothing. That's what they are. Jesus told us, watch out for that stuff. Amen? Um, the fine linen, white and clean. How was it made white? It was made white by the blood of the lamb. The white blood cell covers, it breaks in pieces, and then it consumes. And now there's none of it left. And Psalm 32 is right. When God covers a sin... It's gone. Do you know that Mormon doctrine teaches that if you sin a sin and you go confess it to God and God forgives it, then it stays forgiven until you sin that sin again. And then once you sin that sin again, God uncovers the old sin and puts it back on you. Do you know Finnis Dake? believes that same thing. He teaches that same thing. He teaches Mormon doctrine better than the Mormons do. And Finnis Dake was the, the sort of like the grandfather of guys like Hagen, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Myers. They all, they, they sell a Dake Bible on their websites. They promote the, the Dake Bible. They promote Finnis Dake. Oh, he's the godliest man. He memorized 90% of the Bible, and he could just do this, and he could do that. Dake was so out of his brain, out of his mind crazy with false doctrine. And Dake teaches that you sin, you have to confess it to God right then and there, 
Because if you die, you're going to go to hell. Doesn't matter if you're saved or not. He believes in what's called repeated regeneration, that you are saved until you sin. Then when you sin, you have lost your salvation. You must confess that sin and repent to God to get your salvation back, and you're in good shape until you go sin again. And if you sin that same sin that you've already sinned, then God uncovers the old sin and dumps it back in the pile now with the new sin that you committed. Folks, that's heresy. These people know nothing about the grace of Almighty God and how God covers it. And you don't need to know this stuff about the blood to believe what the Bible says. When God covers sin, it remains covered. Wow. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That is... It just, it, it makes sense now. See, I believed Isaiah 118. I believed it for years before I ever knew anything about white blood cells. But now that I know it, I look at that and I just, tears come to my eyes. God, you're amazing. I believed it and didn't really understand what it means. Now I know a little bit more about it. And God, you're still just as amazing as... as Anything. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Mm, 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 mm. Now, platelets. You ready for this one? We have exactly probably about 12 minutes. Here we go. Platelets. Travel around in your, in your river. All right? Your blood stream. They're just there along for the ride. They don't really do anything. While your bloodstream is intact, the platelets will just float around the river, having themselves a good time. Until something bad happens to a blood vessel. Every now and then, bumps and bruises come our way, cuts and scrapes happen. And you know what a bruise is, don't you? A bruise is where a blood vessel or a vein of some kind is broken and ruptured underneath your skin. And that blood starts leaking out of that. Or let's, let's say there's a cut going on. And you got your skin cut, your hands cut, and you're bleeding. The platelets that up until now did nothing, now they start collecting around the ragged, jagged edges of that vessel or that vein being cut or ruptured open. And what they do is they get activated at that moment and they start building up and they start here comes another set of platelets and it starts attaching themselves to the other platelets that are hanging around the edges of whatever damage is done to the artery or the to the vein or the corpuscle or the capillary or whatever it is now sometimes a cut is too bad and no amount of platelets is going to fix this did, did you know that God said of Israel that her wound is incurable? That's what he said. Think about that next time you think everybody deserves to be healed. God said Israel's wound was incurable. Mm, 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 mm. But you kind of know the rest of the story then, don't you? The platelets are now activated. I just learned this today. I read it. There's an article on Wikipedia that describes platelet activation. And then there's like two other things that the platelets do. But they start, they start building on top of one another, attaching themselves to one another 
until such a time as now, once they're attached and they've activated and they've built this little covering, they now basically stop the bleeding. When you get a cut on your skin or your finger or like cut yourself shaving, guys, or ladies, you're shaving your legs, cut yourself shaving, then what happens is the platelets go into activation and they start building and, and making a, a covering where the, where the breakage was so that you stop bleeding. And here's, here's, here's what my man from India sent me. Here's a picture of it, okay? Activated platelets building up, and now they start tying themselves together to put a stop to the wound. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds, Psalm 147 says. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. Do you see it? Whenever you have a, a cut, you have a breach. There's a hole in your body. And good stuff is running out and bad stuff is getting in. And there's a bad hole there that needs to be healed. And God has already designed it in the blood that whenever there's a breach, God is going to go there and bind it up and heal the wound. Isaiah 58, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called, here it is, here it is, the repairer of the breach the restorer of paths, paths, to do, the restorer of paths. That's what your circulatory system is. It's river paths, and they've been broken. They've been wounded, and it takes the blood of Christ, who is the repairer of the breach. Amen! This is what happens when God's people start reading God's word and thinking God's thoughts. That's what happens. And again, it's, it's, you can say, well, how come God didn't show me that? You've been listening to it for two hours. Doesn't matter who came up with it. Doesn't matter who God used to send it forth. Now everybody can know what's going on. Now everybody can know that those platelets were put there by, by God. And ev listen, every aspect of your blood is a picture of Jesus Christ and how he saves us. Whether it's uncleanness and the white blood cells um, are destroying that uncleanness and covering it, or it's the red blood cells that give us the oxygen and the nutrients so that our bodies and our muscles and our brains can have oxygen and proteins and sugar to burn, or it's the plate, or it's the river that carries all of this around, or it's the platelets that come in when there's been a wound. And the platelets represent Christ and how he is able to repair the breach. Because once the clot is there, that stops the blood flow. And once the clot's there and it is built like a little breach there, uh, a little, little bridge or whatever, it's, it's gapped it up. Now the, the, the vascular system and the way God designed the cells, now the cells that make up the blood veins can kick into gear and they start making new blood vein cells and eventually they grow together. Isn't that cool? God is, I just, I stand in awe of God and his, his awesomeness and his thoughts that are toward us. I, I'm just, uh, there's some more verses here. How much time have I got left? Yeah, I got time. 
Let me, uh, let's see, i got to remember what button to push. Here we go. Let's go back to it here. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Psalm 147.3, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Jeremiah 30.17, for I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, this is Zion whom no man seeketh after. And I want to tell you something. You and I, we're the outcasts. We're the outcasts from our own families. We're the outcasts from our own friends. When we decided to live for the Lord, they cast us away. We're the outcasts from our own churches. Our own pastors kicked us out. Why? Because we said, Pastor, we love you. But please listen to us when we want to teach you or tell you about the Bible. We believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and it has no errors in it up to this very day. There are no mistakes in the King James Version. And once that pastor hears that, you're the outcast. You got put out. And God's just kind of put, uh, I don't know what to call it yet. And I can't really say it in words other than I'm an outcast with you. And all of the people who think they're better than us, they don't mind you being around as long as you serve them. But we're just the common people. We didn't go to the Bible colleges. We didn't go to the seminaries. We don't have the advanced training in Greek and Hebrew. We're just farmers and truck drivers and automotive shop workers and housewives, and that's all we are. We're just common people. But I can tell you, people, you're the outcast, and when they threw you out, and you stand up, you find out you're standing next to Jesus. Who him own his own self. They wouldn't even crucify him in Jerusalem. He had to go outside of the city, out of the camp. And when they threw us out of their camp, we landed right next to where Jesus is. That's where I'd rather be. And so you, you see things like this and you weep. And you rejoice. And you say, God, this Bible is right. There, it, there is no mistakes in this Bible whatsoever. Why can't I convince people? It's because you're an outcast. And yet Jesus came and he healed you of all of your wounds. Even though you were thrown out. Even though, listen to me now, even though probably most of those wounds were self-inflicted. Amen. That's who we are. Oh, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let me hear God's people say amen. That's close enough. Um, let's see here. I'm getting used to these new icons with Windows 10. I'm trying to find my emails here. Uh, let's see here. We got a couple minutes left. Uh, David says... Um, okay, now the word breach, which is more the proper spelling for a wound is or opening used, used 22 times. Do you think there's significance to that? I do, but I'd, I'd have to kind of do the study, study it out. All right, Danny. Danny wants to know what are my thoughts on the 501c3 church? Um, here's what I'm going to tell you, okay? Um, we, Bethel, Bethel Church is not a 501c3. Um, you, you don't have to be as a church, okay? You don't have to be. And um, now I'll say this, okay? Um, I, do, I do not want a 501c3 status for our church if that means that I cannot say things of a political nature from the pulpit, okay? But as a church, we don't have to be, but some churches are. Now, here's what I'm going to say, Okay? I the first thing that I would use to judge whether a church is a good church or not 
It's not going to be its 501c3 incorporated tax status. It's not. The first thing that I'm going to look at or hear from this church is thee and thou and saith and doth. That's the first thing that I'm listening for. The first thing. Because there are, there are churches out there that are not 501c3 that do not preach the King James Bible. And oddly enough, there are people out there who will say, you're not 501c3? Okay, I'll go to your church. They have no idea. They've they've exalt they've taken this little tax status and put it up here as the this is what I'm looking for right here. That's the first thing I'm looking for is I'm listening to hear what Bible they're using. Now then, then you start looking at other things. What is this pastor preaching? What is this guy teaching? Is he teaching the solidness of the word of God or is he playing around with it? What are, the th- what are the things, after you listen for a while, after you listen for a while, and you hear him start dodging certain ideas and certain things that are, should be preached on, you hear him dodging those things, then you can say, ah, you know what, this is not, this not for me. Now, whether the church is 501c3 or not may or may not be the reason why this pastor's dodging issues. It may have nothing to do with, well, the government won't let me uh, endorse a candidate or say political things, so therefore I'm not. It may have nothing to do with that. It may just be that the pastor is a weasel, and he's trying to get everybody in his church to like him and give him more money. That may be the, the source or the core of it. But I don't think that the first thing in your mind questioning whether you should go to a certain church is, are they 501c3? That's not the first thing that I would ask or look for in a church. That may be something on your list. I wouldn't put it up at the top. Because I, I've, been in, I've been in church all my life. And I know that um, a lot of church governments are different, but among Baptists, most Baptists, a lot of probably Assembly of God or whatever churches, the pastor may, may be called from another place to go and pastor this congregation. He may not have any choice on whether or not the church is a 501c3. The church may already be a 501c3. But he's got it in his heart to go to that church And I can tell you, I know guys who do this. Their ministry is to go to try to bring churches out of the trash heap and get them them moving again, and then they move on. That pastor may be trying to get that church out of a lot of Babylonian things, and 501c3 may be one of them. But he can't do that all in one day. He may be a good guy trying to straighten out a church that God wants to work in, and he knows he can't do it all in one day. Maybe they're an NIV church. Maybe they're hooked in with some denomination. Or, or maybe they've had Rick Warren shoved down their throat for the last 15 years. And that pastor goes there with the King James, and he knows what he's got to work with, and he's going to try to bring that church out. So I would not judge... As one of the high priorities, I would not judge a church strictly on their tax status with the IRS. That may be one of those things that God is going to pull them out of, but there are other things that I think are more important than that one. I hope I said this right. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. I hope you don't blast me and say, Hoggard says it's okay to be 501c3. I wonder what he's hiding. Don't do that. Okay? Hey, I love you. It's good to be here today. I think everything worked. All the buttons I pushed. Maybe I pushed some buttons I don't know about with some people. Anyway, it's been good to be with you. I've enjoyed it. Had a good time today. Watchman video broadcast coming out. The Groves. We'll see you Sunday. God bless you. Bye-bye.